This week we've come to Salford, a busy city alongside Manchester, but with a character and a history of its own, and evidence of a great pioneering spirit. Here at Worsley, the Duke of Bridgewater established the world's first canal independent of a river. It carried coal to workplaces five miles to the southeast. The cost, fourpence a hundredweight. It was an ambitious enterprise which reduced the price of coal and helped industry flourish in the northwest of England. More than a century later came another audacious scheme, the Manchester Ship Canal, one of the Victorian's greatest engineering projects. It meant that ocean-going vessels could travel 35 miles inland from Merseyside. It brought the sea to Salford, and from their opening in 1894, the docks were amongst the busiest in Britain. But in the 1970s, the patterns of commerce changed. Containers took over. The docks declined. And so the city of Salford turned its face to the future. They'd already been the first municipal authority to have a museum and a library 150 years ago. And now they built the massive and stylish Lowry Arts Centre on the apex of one of the old wharves. Inside the Arts Centre, with its array of theatres and galleries, the jewel in the crown the works of Salford's most famous citizen. Lawrence Stephen Lowry was born in 1887. He began developing his evocative but controversial style between the two world wars. The art establishment was slow to appreciate him. Lowry worked as a rent collector and in his spare time created images of a provincial urban life that has now disappeared. The public grew to love his unmistakable pictures. His matchstick men and women even inspired a pop song. These exhibits reaffirm Lowry as one of the most distinctive artists Britain has ever produced. You may recall that this example came to light when the Antiques Roadshow visited Oldham a year ago. He'd given it to his driver. Lowry used Peel Park as the setting for many of his pictures. And today, a new generation of the people of Salford are making their way to the university, which is hosting this week's roadshow. These are great fun things. They're, they're of course, candle extinguishers yes. for putting out a candle. Yes. Um, made by Royal Worcester somewhere around about 1950, 1952. Something like that, just post Second World War. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had them a long time? About 25 years. Hmm. And what, what did you pay for them? Uh, there was a little black boy as well. Hmm. I gave £7.50 for the three. For the three things? Mm. So less than £7.50 for these two. Yes, yes. They're jolly lies. This is a monk. He's great. He's wearing his brown habit and uh, he's reading his book and he's great. Yes. Um, and the Mandarin, there's a Mandarin from China. Yes. Um, he's in a wonderful yellow and orange colour, isn't he, with a black hat. And um, yes. I think he's tremendous. They're both very good. They're both very collectible now. Yes. And uh, your £7.50 has gone up a bit. Um, I suppose the monk's going to be £150 or £200. And the oh. Mandarin's going to be around about £250. Oh, dear. So, so you've got two jolly nice things yes. there. Lovely. You're yeah. happy about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, a lot more. But this, uh, this is terribly interesting. This is, uh, of course, Minton. And uh, absolutely marvellous. How did you come by this? My father bought it for my mother um, 66 years ago. Yes. And he gave £2.10 ten shillings out of a second hand shop. £2.10 ten shillings. Mm. That going back then, quite a lot of money, of course, it wasn't. Yes. It? That, yes. My mother yes. saw it and wouldn't buy it because she said it was too dear. And my dad went back and bought it. Did he? I guess great. Of course, it, it's, it, they're Chinese, I suppose, in in a kind of a boat. It's all, yeah. almost like a European gondola, because it, it's made in England, actually. Yeah. Uh, and it's a quite extraordinary little piece. The, the whole structure of it is, is tremendous fun. I, you know, in, in the, these little chaps rowing their, um, rowing their boat along, and uh, he's got a fan, just like this little Mandarin. Yes. Incredible how similar these thoughts are. are. Yes. And yet, this is, well, almost 100 years earlier than, than, yeah, than these they. extinguishers. Somewhere about the 1870s, 1875, yeah. something like that. And I think it's quite extraordinary. M modeled by a man called Henk, and they're fairly rare things. Oh. Have you had them insured or valued? I had it valued. Uh, 
and he told me four hundred pound. Four hundred pound. Mm, about six months ago. I think that's probably a little low. Um, I, I'd reckon because of its rarity, I, I think you're probably looking at a thousand pounds or twelve hundred pounds, something like that. Oh. So that's a lot a bit more than what I thought. A lot and, more. And yeah. from two pounds, ten shillings. That's, that's a, a good decent yeah. price, yeah. isn't it, over buy. the yeah. years? But more important than yeah. that, you, you like it, do you? Yeah, yeah. I, it's a wonderful bottle. I, I, tremendous. Now, is there Russian blood in the family? No, not at all. My grandfather worked in Russia mm -hmm. um, at the turn of the century. I think he spent about four or five years there. He was a mining engineer. A mining engineer. And, and, and he was an Englishman? Yes. And do you think they were given to him originally? Um, or no, I, I know that he bought... This, um, this box, which I thought was a, assume is a cigarette box. Yes. When did he leave Russia? It'll, it will have been at least 90, 92, 93 years ago. Yes, I see. Oh, well, that's interesting. Yeah. And this one here, which is a, an interesting object too, it's a Vesta case. Um, before the advent of the lighter, everybody had to carry matches. They were called Vestas. They were um, impregnated with wax. And, um, and, 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 as, and smoking, everybody did. This is a technique called niello. It's a black sulfurous alloy which is laid into the surface of the silver, mm -hmm. filling the engraving on there, oh, and then it's polished yeah. down to be brought flush with the surface. Yeah. It's a very, very Russian technique. Lovely, lovely family history for you, mm. and um, two to three hundred pounds today. Really? And these cigarette cases are of a type that we recognise. It's not absolutely complete. There's a mysterious sort of yes, hole I'm... going through it. Have you ever wondered I, what that's for? I wondered for? what it was. Yes, do tell me. Well, it used to contain a tinder, which was a material that you could light from the matchbox here at the end, uh -huh. and you could strike your matches, take them out of here, yes. strike, strike them, them on, on there, there, pull up the tinder with a, a silver pull here, uh -huh. Light it, and then when the wind from Siberia was blowing <laughs> incredibly hard, yeah. you'd pass it around to all your friends who'd light their cigarettes from oh, that I see. particular so tinder. Was... Really? Uh, there was also a fashion for covering cigarette boxes with these ciphers. They're little souvenirs of, of moments in the life of the original owner. He was probably um, in connection with the imperial family at some, on some level or another. Um, yeah. We can tell that from these. Romanov eagles that appear not once but twice on the uh -huh. cigarette case, and I believe they're the tops of stick pins that have been taken away and mounted onto the front of this cigarette case. Oh. And they meant a lot to him. It dates from 1899 to 1908. Really? So it's a rather good span. Yeah. I think it would be an, an important object to the new Russian collectors. Really? And so it's yes. gone up. Probably. Really? Yes, it oh, has. I was without afraid that it had gone down with, with the market <laughs> opening. No, oh, no, no, on the contrary. No. The Russians are very keen on the, on the sale rooms. They love to, to bid at auction for their yeah. heritage, um, which they scorned at the time, frankly. Yes. I, I think probably if it turned up uh, somewhere in a European sale at which they were in, in attendance, um, £800, maybe £1,200 wouldn't really? be too much, Good really. Happens. Ralph Herbert Lord was a well-known Victorian photographer Yes, he was my great-grandfather. Oh, was he? Uh-huh. How fascinating. With his wife there? Yes, uh, on holiday in Southport, I think. Oh, lovely. <laughs> and here we have an album of his photographs. Yes. Some of them, just the ones that he used to submit to exhibitions. Right. OK. Let's have a look at them. An idle moment. Isn't that a wonderful evocation of uh, late Victorian England? It is, yes. yes. He, he lived in the Cambridge when he was doing photography. Right. And, of course, a lot of the scenes are from Cambridge. Of the fens, yes. 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 And here you could see the farmer having a brief respite from That's his right. ploughing and talking to his wife. Uh-huh. And then let's move on to an... Oh, this is a famous photograph, isn't it? Yes, that's, that's one of the ones that he won the gold medal at the... Royal Photographic Society. That, and it's Neddy... Um, Neddy's New Shoes. That's right, yes. Again, a terrific uh, photograph, isn't it? He was a wonderful artist. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. And here we've got one entitled You Stupid Boy, um, which is obviously a posed photograph. You can see the master here about to clip the boy around the ear for not getting his sums correct. That's right. Of course, these are Platino-type photographs of large size, so he would have needed a lot of equipment to carry around with him. Uh, yes, actually, that, that is the size of the plate. Yes. And he used to have a camera on the back of a cart. He used to go around with a horse and cart. Oh, wonderful. Oh, and another well-known photograph. How's that? 
marvellous condition again. And you can see here the old boy taking snuff. That's right. And the other gentleman with the snuff box in his hand. Yeah. And another one here, try again. Um, oh, now, this looks like... It, are these superimposed? They are, yeah. yes. And he put um, a pile of bricks here to make the shadow from the gentleman's legs. Wonderful. Well, his photographs do appear at auction from time to time, and uh, he's recognised as a very gifted artist in that field. It's nice um, to know. Mm, and I would think that uh, the value of this album at auction probably lies in the region of perhaps six to eight thousand pounds. Gosh, that's a total surprise. Just down the hall there. Horseman Q you'll find over there, and jewellery is just behind you. How many yeah. tickets do you reckon you have? Probably about 1,500. 1,500? Yeah. That's an astonishing collection. Did yeah. it take long to get together? Probably about 20 years. Yeah, amazing. And when did you start collecting? 1959, when I started train spotting. But where have they all come from? Um, it's just acquaintances swapping railway armour and various items of railway memorabilia. You're fond of uh, yeah. railways, obviously. Yeah. I think some of them are rather fascinating because uh, one dog, for example, yes. which is quite interesting. Yeah. But which, which is your favourite? That's the one there. This one here. And that was your ticket? Yes. And that station is actually closed now. It's Manchester Central, which is now the GMX Centre. Really? Yes. It's absolutely wonderful. It's a tremendous collection. How much have you paid for these tickets? Nothing. It's just things I've exchanged. Various right. items of railway and memorabilia. What do you reckon the collection's worth? I haven't a clue. Haven't a clue? Well, no. You know, there are a tremendous number of people collecting railway honour these days, right. particularly tickets. There's a, yes. there's a, tr there's a huge market, yes. and I see the prices that they're fetching. Yes. And you will be astounded by some of the prices that, really? that some tickets actually fetch. I would, I would think that um, if you bought these through postal auctions today, right. you'd certainly have to pay something in the region of two, three thousand pounds really? for the collection. Oh, yes. Well, you've got 1,500 tickets. Yeah. It's a tremendous collection. <laughs> I wish fun. it were mine. I'm gobsmacked. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah. What happened? It just fell out of my hand. Fell out of my hand. I have to tell you that on every road show, there is a crash and the client has dropped something. The best packing material, if you can't get that plastic bubble stuff, is newspaper. I have to tell you, you haven't ruined anything of any great merit. Uh, we're looking at something here which was made in the 1950s and it's going to be, it was worth, before you put paid to it, about 10 or 15 pounds. So, not quite the disaster it might have been, but uh, sorry that happened. Well, it used to um, hang in my father-in-law's office and then um, my, fa uh, my husband brought it home um, some years ago and it's just that that's all I know really about it. I don't know where it came from. It's a it's an enjoyable picture, isn't it? It actually breathes quality and enthusiasm. He's uh, an artist who was born in 1816, as it says on the Mount there, and died in 1869. He lived a fascinating life. He studied um, at the age of 23 under the East Anglian artist James Stark. The, the quality in depth is amazing. So many artists put everything, as it were, in the front window, in the right, front. Yes. But this artist put things in depth. And so his sense of depth is, is absolutely amazing. And the colours are very good, aren't they? Yes. The colours are very good. Well, indeed. And it, it hasn't been in direct sunlight. It, it's yes. slightly faded, very slightly. But it hasn't been in direct sunlight, clearly. It's been moved, hasn't it, from yes. one wall to another wall now? Good. Yeah. Mm, so you're away from the sun. Good. I'm glad yes. to hear that. There is a little bit of staining here, yes. and also on the other side. Mm. And uh, there's a slight amount of damage down here. Yes, I noticed that last night when I was wrapping but it up. Those things really can be so easily uh, repaired. Um, it's truly a, 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 a tremendous example of a river landscape by one of our very best 19th century watercolourists. Now we come down to the, the point of value. Have you ever had it valued? No, no. What would you think it's worth? What would you assess it out? I, I, th I think about 5,000. Oh, no, no. I don't, no. I don't know. What would you think? 1,000 mark, around 1,000 no. mark. Well, I don't know. you're nearer it. It, it, it is 
certainly a, about 5,000 yes. to about 7,000 pounds. On a good day, yes. who knows, maybe up to 10. Yes, oh, it and is, going up all the time. <laughs> well, absolutely. As long as you keep it in good condition, yes. you keep it out of the sun and look after it. Well, my grandfather was a soldier in the Boer War. And when he came home in 1902, he brought this collection uh, home. And I understand that it was a, a Zulu wedding dress. Whether it was or not, I don't know. That is fascinating. But what about the photographs? The photographs were never seen by the children, the grandchildren. They, they were always kept underneath in a brown envelope. And it was only this last few years that they came to light to us. Really? Only yes. just literally Six recently? Years ago. And do you think your grandfather took the photographs? I doubt it. Doubt it. I doubt it very yeah. much. No. Well, yeah. this is absolutely fascinating for me to see. This is how they wore their beads. We see beads on the roadshow, but we don't know where they were meant to be put. And so this is a wonderful record of a Zulu wedding outfit, if you like. Now. We've got three of these. That's, that's the, probably the best one. They are fading a little bit. They, uh, they have got a little bit of discoloration, but um, the fact that we've got three here, different girls, this one's a bit more faded, um, all wearing this particular wedding dress, which they made themselves out of the beads that they um, would have. And this one's, again, a bit faded. We've got a back view here. Uh, bare bottoms, and this here is one of the little fringes that was worn by these girls in the front, and it goes round the waist and hangs in front very delicately and charmingly. And look at this fantastic condition, it is absolutely mint. So it might have been worn once, and that's it. So you've got that, and then you've got what they wore round their necks. Again, you'd wear it how she was doing it, round there. A lot of work in that to make it round. I don't know whether you've ever done beadwork, but it is um, a labour of love. And this one a little bit longer also to go round the neck. And this here, which goes round quite a small waist. So although that lovely lady looked buxom, she had quite a small waist, I think. Um, but here we have what the men would have worn, which right. it's such a pity we don't have the men in the photographs, but they would have worn these. And what I love about them is they're both the same colouring on the one side, and on the other side, it's completely different. Yes. So it's, if you like double, they could wear them back back to front and inside out, and superb condition. And if only we could see the, the couple wearing these in real life, it would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Now, uh, Zulu um, beadwork from that time, from the 1900s, is now very popular. It's become um, a popular collecting field in this country. And I don't know whether you've ever had it valued, no, it's no, the first it's time that it's actually been taken out of the cabinet, to our knowledge. Yes. It's very difficult to put a price on it, but the photographs themselves certainly have a value in their own right. Um, those, I would say, could be worth as much as 80 to 100 pounds each. They, they are very special. Um, the beads, all together, I suppose we could be talking about 500 pounds. I'm amazed. <laughs> That's amazing. When I was younger, I always thought that my uncle had brought it back from the Second World War when he was in Thailand. Mm. But only recently did I find out uh, from my auntie that it came from Farmworth Cooperative Society. <laughs> in, in England? Because yes. <laughs> he's, he's an English dragon. Really, yes, you know? yeah. I mean, he looks badly oriental, but um, of course the mark on the back is Charlotte Reed, um, the great potter in uh, stoke on Trent, who... Um, uh, developed uh, an incredible system of um, what's called tube lining. That is, uh, you, you, out of a tube, you, you squeeze clay to make a pattern of the dragon and all these decorations around the air, and then the girls in the factory would then fill it up very carefully. And so you've got a, a raised pattern filled up with this with this thing. But he's a very English dragon. <laughs> I mean, I can understand somebody thinking he might be Chinese. <laughs> 
but this is purely English style, of course, all this decoration is, mm -hmm. and I suppose in date, um, 1930 would be, uh -huh. would be a good date for that. A, a fine tube lined Charlotte Reed dish like this mm. is, is going to be probably more than something from the Far East at that time. I mean, we must be looking at three, four hundred pounds. Mm. Right. So it's, it's a jolly nice dish. Yes. It is. So enjoy it as an English dragon. Yes, we will. <laughs> I bought this um, the brooch at an auction room in Melbourne, in Australia. Uh, in Australia um, I think about two years ago. So how do you come to bring it to us then? Yeah. Um, I'm I'm actually going to a wedding in Ireland of um, the son of an Australian friend, and Alice and my friends in Manchester, who I'm staying with, had said that she might be coming to the Antique Road Show in the uh, few days I was spending with her in Manchester. And one of the uh, the ladies in my French polishing class jokingly said, Sue, if you get on the Antique Road Show while you're uh, in, in England, we can watch you on television in Australia. And so they can. <laughs> they can indeed. What a happy ending. <laughs> Except, of course, that it's got to be looked at by an expert, and uh, so I think our Geoffrey Munn is the man. Best of luck to you in the future, sincerely, Elvis Presley. Yeah. Goodness me, how did you come by this? Back in 1959, when I was young. Yes. Um, I wrote to him. Yeah. It was when he was in the army in Germany. And like you do when you're young. And yes, were you a great fan of his? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Loved him. And I just pleaded with him for a reply. Well, it's dated 1959, so he was born in the mid-1930s, so he would have been about 25, yes, and yeah. doing his national service. Yeah, it's over the moon. Yes, I and bet. That's why it's a bit tatty, really. Yes, what happened to it? Is this a teardrop? Were you so excited <laughs> that you started crying when you got the letter? No, it's been in my dressing table drawer for years, mm. and that perfume spilt on it. Oh, is it? Yeah. Yes. But this, it came apart. That's who keep opening it to show people. Yes. There is uh, a good market in rock and roll memorabilia, as I'm sure you know. And after the Beatles, Elvis is probably the most collected of artists. Yeah. And obviously this is just a little note, but even still it has a wonderful history to it. And I don't suppose you're going to sell it. No. No, absolutely. Hang on to it. But despite its condition, uh, if this came up at auction, it would probably fetch, I suspect, five or six hundred pounds. Yeah. So thank you for bringing it in and long live the king. Yeah. These intrigue me. I can't say I've come across any by this particular maker before. Well, Patrick Leonard of Salford, fascinating maker. As far as I know, he's the only chap who ever worked in Salford in, in silver. Yes. Um, we're looking at 100 plus for a piece, and probably similar with the dessert spirit. I say I can't remember ever coming across a piece of his work before. Anyways, I think you've probably cornered the market in Patrick Leonard. They've been in our family since 1916, so my mother says. Right. And they were bought at Kendall's in Manchester for five guineas. And that's as far as I know and as far as what my mother tells me. Yeah. Okay. I know we're talking local. Right. In yes. every sense of the word. Yes. yes. Because yes. we're talking Lancastrian pottery. Uh, Pilkington's exactly. Royal yes. Lancastrian yes. pottery. Yes. And the place of manufacture is how many miles is it to Swinton from where we're yeah. sitting? Uh, about four miles. Oh, and we live you? about ten minutes walk ten away minutes from walk. where these vases were actually made. Right. Yeah. Okay. First of all, the mark. Now, I've seen a mark there that's slightly different. I know that this mark was brought in around about 1914 because the early mark is a large P with two Bs climbing around it. But the mark that we've got here is the Lancastrian rose. What makes it interesting is the very fact that it's actually got the date. Now, in this case, I'm, I'm reading on this one either 1916 or 1918. And, you know, I've got to say, I've not, not seen a piece dated like this before. Yeah. We think it's 16. 1916. Yes. Well, that would make yes. sense. Yeah. Yeah. And let's, let's face it, five guineas mm -hmm. uh, each. Yes. In nine, uh, it's a tidy mm -hmm. sum. Yeah, yeah. it was. Anyway, let's look at the pots. It's first of all, a nice shape. Mm. Nice Chinese shape, okay. um, often referred to as a Mayping uh, shape, this lovely, elegant shoulder uh, form. The one thing that Pilkington's really did uh, master um, was luster decoration. Mm. The luster is, is nicely done, but I've got to say that it hasn't fired 100% perfect. Mm. But the fish, they're, I mean, they're, they're quite magic. There's a sense of movement there, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, but again, the luster, I don't think it's taken 100%. No. And this is, this is what collectors are looking for. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to say that 
from a collectability point of view, um, they are desirable. Desirable. Yeah, they are. This fella, I would suspect, is probably around about four hundred pounds. Um, whereas the fish, a little bit more desirable. Yeah. I think you're looking there somewhere in the, the region of around about six hundred or thereabouts. Mm. But I would stress mm. that had the actual uh, luster decoration been stronger, right. then you could probably add at least fifty percent onto, oh, right. onto those figures. Well, I tell you what we can say about this is that it's a platinum-mounted Ceylon sapphire and, and diamond brooch. And it's not so much the quality of the stones that's of interest here, but it's the expression of the Art Deco style. There's a sort of whiff of Japanese ornament in here, perhaps Chinese ornament. And that's something that the Art Deco jewellers took on board um, and brought into their repertoire. And, and so I was jolly pleased to see it there. It's a, have you, do you know Selfridges? Do you remember? Yes, of course I yes. There used to be a lift in Selfridges, there probably is even now, an Art Deco lift. And in a way, the same decorative sources have been used um, in this piece of jewellery, which I think is great. They are Ceylon sapphires. They're, they're paler than perhaps one might have you know, wanted, really. I mean, a pure cornflower blue is the, is the colour that one looks for. And this is a, a, a very pleasing blue, but it's not of the intensity to send the value absolutely whistling through the roof. But a very beautiful object nonetheless. I think that these stones have probably been cut in in Ceylon, because you can see at the back here that the, there's a sort of asymmetrical um, yeah. point. It tends to veer towards the right in the centre stone, which is a, a clue to me, as well as from the front, that these stones were, were cut in the Orient um, by a less sophisticated lapidary than one might have expected to find in, in Europe. But what a beautiful thing. And so, come on, you were at the auction, your heart was pounding. Uh, and uh, so how far did you go? 3,800 or 4,000 Australian dollars. So 1,250 well, pounds? Something like that, I think. Well, yes. yes, well, I think that was a very, very good move indeed, I must say. I think it would be jolly difficult for you to find this brooch for 1,250 pounds. I think somewhere like double would be more appropriate. Mm, yeah. So, great thing. Very clever of you to have chosen it, and jolly nice of you to bring it over and show us. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. I bought it at an auction about three years ago with a small legacy from my aunt. Um, and it reminded me of my little boy, Faith, anyway. What a nice idea. Um, I mean, did you kind of, when you got your legacy, think, well, I must buy a painting of a mother and child, or you kind of had the money, went to an auction, thought this... Well, no, I, I was interested in buying a painting of a mother and child. My, my aunt was very fond of children, couldn't have any of her own, so um, it, it seemed very appropriate to remember her by, as well yes. as being yes. pertinent to my situation, having yes. a new baby how myself. How very nice, how yeah. very nice. Now, I think it's an absolutely charming painting, and... Um, it's interesting, it's painted by this artist you can see here, Eugène Larue, yes. um, in the 19th century. But it reminds me of an earlier artist, a French artist, Chardin, mm -hmm. and there's been an exhibition recently of his work. Um, even figures wearing rather similar caps, and of course these famous still lifes, and we have a rather beautiful still life in the background. And I think he's been very clever, this artist, in, in the way that um, uh, it's beautifully painted, and exists on its own, but it doesn't detract from the main figures, the mother and the rather beautiful child. Well, just returning to the signature here, it's also quite interesting, but just below it, and in fact beneath a, a, a layer of paint, is in fact his signature again in the date 1869, and I think that's probably drawn in with black chalk or a pencil. So that's um, a kind of interesting bit of detail, and why that happened, I don't really know. Can I ask you how much you paid at auction? Yes, I paid £2,000 for it. Well, that doesn't seem a great price for such a beautiful picture. I don't think it's an extraordinary value, but I think what is nice, this painting probably worth three, £4,000. And I think for that kind of money, because things are so expensive today, that to be able to get a painting of this quality uh, for that kind of figure, I think, is um, extremely good value. Well, thank you very much indeed for bringing it in. Well, they came from my mother's house, mm -hmm. and my mother died recently, and we had to dispose of the contents of the house. Probably at the last week that we were finishing all the removal, we had the hospice van come to take the remaining goods away. <laughs> and my friend here, Yvonne, said to me, well, how much do you think they're worth? She said, I think you're going to be surprised. Oh, well done, Yvonne. Oh. Um, do you know what they are at all? Well, Did you look when you when Yvonne no. said... Um... Uh, well, she turned them over and said there is a signature on the bottom. OK. 
Hannah Barlow. Hannah, Hannah Barlow. Barlow, absolutely. Hannah B. Barlow, one of the two Barlow sisters. Um, she had a sister, Florence, and they worked at the Dalton factory in Lambeth. Uh, they both went to Lambeth Art School and joined, and they both did this style of decoration. That is scraffito, scratching into the glaze to produce the design. And eventually, they came to an arrangement that Florence would do the birds and Hannah would do the animals. So they, they split it between them. But these are relatively early. We've got her monogram here. We've got ES. That stands for Eliza Simmons. And she was responsible for all the rest of the decoration in here. And then we've got the Dalton mark with the rosette mark and the word England. But it doesn't say Royal Dalton it says Dalton, so it's before 1901 and after 1891, so we can date it pretty precisely, 1895 there and about. Um, cows she did quite a lot, we, we see uh, a lot of them, but this size of vase is actually quite uncommon. Um, they're a splendid pair in really remarkable condition. We've just got one uh, small chip there. It's made a bit of difference to the price, but not an awful lot. Yvonne actually has done you a bit of a favour because they're now worth close on two thousand pounds. Thank you very much. Happy? Goodness. Very. Good. Excellent. Thank you very much. And, the Rembrandt uh, Hotel. Yeah. So um, Tony Warren and uh, quite a lot of these people on here now have been drinking in there. So somebody at some point gave it to them, and then it ended up in the cellar, and I found it on a load of rubbish and. Uh, the so you owns, saved it? Pretty much, yeah. But um, the bloke who owns it, Peter, didn't think it's worth anything at all. He wanted to throw it out, so I said to bring it along today. Well, the nice thing about it is each, each photograph here is personally signed. And the one in the, the middle, Elizabeth Dawn, is signed to the Rembrandt Hotel. So it's, it's a unique set of signatures. Um, I would have thought to a true fan, this is going to be worth somewhere in the region of about three or four hundred pounds. That's quite good. I'd be pleased with that anyway. They might take a bit more care of it rather than throw it in the cellar now. This is a remarkable piece of work. This is an early draft manuscript of Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time. Now, how did you get this? Um, I got it thanks to a geography teacher uh, from school. I had a bad accident whilst I was doing my A-levels at school and I was doing physics and things like that. But it turned out my geography teacher had gone to school with Professor Hawkins and so I wrote to him to ask Professor Hawkins to write to me and sort of encourage me to perhaps carry on and go to university and things. And this is what I received back, uh, his original sort of script for his famous book. And the best bit being that he hadn't quite finished it and he wrote his last page handwritten um, at the end. So he's saying at the end that he hopes he'd be very disappointed if there wasn't an ultimate theory to the end of the universe unified theory that he wants and he thinks somebody will get there in the end. And how about yourself? Did you go on and get your degree? Uh, I did, but unfortunately not from Cambridge, not quite as smart as him. I got my physics degree at York. Oh, fair enough. And this is a treasure, isn't it? It certainly is for a physicist. It's great, yeah. We've got beautiful illumination here, done, I would say, turn of the century by Alan Tabor. That's right. Now, yeah, my father-in-law. Well, it's not a name I know, and yet this no, work well, is... well, it was fairly local in Manchester and Salford, yes. actually, uh, most of his work. He worked for Manchester Corporation in Salford. And what was his history? How did he... he started life as a tailor, I believe. Did he? Cross-legged, sewing, and didn't like it very much, and he used to go down to the British Museum and look at the manuscripts there and copy them. And these were done, I believe, for practice, really? yes. Oh, yeah. And I'm then not... he set up in business eventually and, and worked did scrolls and things yeah. for presentations to famous Astoundingly people. Astoundingly good quality. I mean, He's amazing. I'm amazed that this is amateur work. Yeah, he was um, amazing. We have here a Longfellow of the bridge in lovely red Morocco, and here a uh, Gray's Elegy mm -hmm. that he did in 1914. How old would he have been then? Well, um, he married in 1912, and yes. I think he was about 23 or 4 then. It's beautiful work, I must say. Absolutely beautiful. And they're executed in vellum and with these marvellous historiations of birds and roses here. That's right, yeah. Absolutely sensational. And the, and the sort of gold leaf too, which has lasted an amazing time. Yes, hasn't, hasn't it? it? 
Well, I must say, I'm most impressed. I mean, they are really top quality objects. They're and they're beautifully yeah. bound. Yeah. Especially this Gray's Energy, which I think is a lovely job. Have you ever had them valued? No, not really. I've often wondered what value they were, although they're not that it would be sold. Yes. They're um, family, family history. heirlooms, yes, really, aren't quite, they? Quite, quite. Um, I think at auction today, you would have to expect, you know, this group um, to command a figure something in the region of five, six thousand pounds for the, the four. The four? Yeah, yes. The three? Yeah, wow. Yes. Gosh, yeah. Thank, thank you, very, you much. very much. My husband bought me because they were interesting. Yeah. He, he had a good eye for antiques and yes, always yes, interested yes, yes. in antiques. They're a cross between, if you look at here, they're wonderfully, it's wonderfully grotesque yeah, shapes yes, here. Yes. Head. They are, it's a cross between a dragon and a fish. Oh, I see, yes. So they're dragonfish. Yeah. Dragonfish. And what yes. are they doing? They're leaping from these wonderfully carved, frothing waves. Yes. You get this idea of carp jumping up the rapids, get yes. the other side, and when after this great effort, uh, they then are then transformed into a dragon. Oh, I see. Okay. But I think it was in some way linked with uh, passing exams, you know, great heroic efforts and succeeding, when the Chinese passed their exams in the uh, bureaucratic system of the civil service. Of course, these actually are Japanese, because the Japanese also made these sort of things, yes. also in bronze, too. Yes. So these are Japanese ivories, but very much influenced by a Chinese idea. And the eyes, you think the eyes, aren't they fabulous? They are beautiful. Well, they're made yeah. of mother of pearl. Yeah. Oh, are they really? Yep. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, as with all these Japanese ivories of that period, I mean, I'm talking about the end of the last century, the quality of carving, of course, is superb. Mm. So if you look at details, the scales around the mouth here, I referred to earlier as wonderfully curling frothy waves. Yes. It's typical uh, Japanese work craftsmanship at its best. Uh, you paid £20 for them? Yes, roughly, I think, yes. Well, yeah. and that was about 30, about 40... About 35 years, 30 yes. to 40 Not so long years ago, ago, yes. Which is a fantastic find yeah. then, actually. Yes. It yeah. wasn't as though they were bought 100 years ago. No. So they made a huge increase, really, because they're now worth about 1,000 to 1,500 quid, I oh, think. Yes, very nice. Yes. Isn't it? Lovely, yes. Very nice surprise. I was bequeathed it by an aunt, a maiden aunt of mine. She had about three years ago. And she said, I'm going to leave you this picture. But she, in turn, had been left it by her boss in the civil service. And then she passed it on to me. Oh, very nice. It's uh, the rebuilding of Rylands. Now, tell yes. me about Rylands. Rylands is where Debenham is now in Piccadilly, Manchester. Yes. And um, the building was knocked down, the old building, and rebuilt. I, I presume it was about 1929 when this picture was taken. Yes, the signature here yeah. and the date. 29. 1929. And I think that's obviously the work in progress. Yes. He has done other pictures which we went to see at the Lowry Gallery. Yes. Showing the complete finished building. Well, just talking about the subject of the picture, I, I think that it is a, uh, a very interesting composition with all these uh, girders here yes. for the construction yes. of these buildings and then the figures and almost a cliff face here yes, with, the, it is. with the train. It's got lots of detail and lots of activity and I like the way that the whole sheet is is full of information it is. yes but of course with Lowry and with other artists but particularly with Lowry there are a lot of fakes yes and um, you know we must be careful and in fact I would recommend to you that you check with the Lowry Centre yes uh, to get their final opinion yes but I think it's absolutely right. Yes. And, and there are other things, just kind of supplementary details yes. or bits of evidence, which I yes. think one must yeah. consider. The kind of rather nice ordinary oak moulding, which... Yes, that was the original frame. The original frame. Yes. The mount here. And yes. you can see along here, totally discoloured by light. Yes. All the impurities, if you're not yes. careful, going into the, into the drawing. Yes. Uh, it's it kind of, I suppose, in a way, it looks right, but it smells right also. <laughs> now, um, I don't know if you've had it insured or... No, we don't have it insured. We, we just have it on the ordinary household insurance. Yes, and you're going to have to change your thinking completely yes. because it's difficult in a rising market and still rising, but yes. what about £30,000? Never. That's a bit more than we thought. <laughs> <laughs> so it's worth about 1500 quid or something like that. Well, uh, earlier in my life, I was connected with the whaling industry. I came across it in the early 1960s 
I acquired it from a, an old merchant marine uh, sailor. He told me that he'd got it from someone many years previously. Other than that, I really can't tell you so very anyway, much about its history. It could have gone from one whaler to another sailor and to another sailor and finally to you. Mm. These engraved whale's teeth are called scrimshaw and they were done throughout the 19th century by whalers who probably on those days they couldn't be out there catching the whales because they weren't around, so they decorated whale's teeth. I don't know if you're aware of it, but we see many, many replicas and reproductions, uh, and they're made from a plastic resin. One way to actually tell the difference between a replica and a real one is that you can actually see right up inside the root of the tooth here. So um, this is absolutely genuine. What I also like about it is it, it's quite crudely decorated. Sometimes you see them, they're very detailed. This one is very crude. Um, and you can actually see that there's been some um, alterations here. He must have had something in his hand, this chap, whose name is Jim Crow. Uh, and somebody's just altered it slightly. And it's great colour. You know, the pattern of colour, the reproductions one a very grey in colour. This one's beautifully uh, orange and yellow all the way down here to this sort of dark tobacco colour down at the bottom. It's a portrait of this, this guy, Jim Crow, and if you just turn it around, along here it says Anne H. Dean, and the date 1854. Right. You turn it on, around the other side, and then there's this portrait of a um, merchantman or, or a man of war. Um, but what's interesting here, it's got the American flag. Right, yes. yes. So maybe it's an American Scrimshander who did this, mm. which if it is, makes it a, a very desirable. And if you keep on going round, it says Jim Crow for New York. So it could have been about his travel, going to New York, maybe this was his girlfriend, who knows. Right. But, you know, an absolutely genuine, honest scrimshaw. Have you had it valued before? No, I haven't actually. No, no. I did buy it. Oh, it was something like five pounds, I think it was, or something <laughs> right. like that, quite honestly. So, it was Five pounds, but a long was, time ago. Yes. Yes. Well, a couple of years ago, I would have said this would, might have been worth maybe between two and three thousand pounds. However, there is a, a great resurgence of interest in English and American folk art. And today at auction, we would probably expect it to fetch between six and eight thousand pounds. Good gracious. It's honestly. not a bad buy for five pounds. Wow, that's honestly, you've really astounded me there. You really have. I love it. Thank you very much for bringing it in. <sighs> wow. Well, many thanks to the University of Salford for opening their doors to us today. I think we've learned quite a lot. I was talking to a man earlier who now owns the house in Station Road where Ellis Lowry lived with his mother and turned out some of his finest work over a period of nearly 40 years. The sad thing is, I'm told, his mother never enjoyed a single thing he ever painted. Until next week, from Salford, goodbye. <laughs>